You have five minutes. I'm sorry, I just can't give you any more time. I nod and turn down the steps and back onto the Brooklyn sidewalk. Fuck. 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 Redial. I hear the giggle at the beginning of his custom message. Hang up. Fuck. The already sizable ball of anxiety that sits in my chest begins to expand further, pushing air out of my lungs. Without thinking, my feet begin to move away from the bus, away from everyone else. I have five minutes. Left. Left. Left my wife and 45 kids in a starving condition with nothing but gingerbread think I did. Right. Right. Right from the country, hate for Stratford shift my gender left. Left. My parents separated when I was four. My sister was nine and my brother three. Throughout our childhood, our weird split-level family was held together by the incredible work of my parents, who remained remarkably animal. I can close my eyes and see myself in the backseat of my dad's van, brother in front of me, sister riding a shotgun. As the streetlights of the Danforth flash through our car windows. So dad lived in walking distance from our school. So on the nights we were at our mom's place, he'd drive the half hour, pick us up, and bring us home to sleep. Being in transit became something like a third home. A home that often only Dave and I share. Left. Left. I reached the cross street. The mouth of the steps up from the subway gaped at me, mocking me in its emptiness. I just left a bus of 45 activists in a dubious position with nothing but a promise that I'd be back with him. But I didn't know where he was, and to be honest, I didn't really know where I was, except for the name on the street where the bus was parked. When I volunteered to leave one of the five buses to New York, never once did it occur to me that I might not be on that bus back. <laughs> but here, now, I was four minutes away from that reality. I fittingly glance up and down the street, and I still don't see him. I call again. Voicemail. I look back and see the four remaining buses, all ready to make the convoy back to Toronto, all waiting for one last person. My seatmate. My brother. Dave. I've learned a lot about the regulations uh, that long-distance bus, tri bus drivers face during this trip. And the most important one was that they're legally not allowed to be, legally not allowed to be working for longer than 12 consecutive hours. The bus ride from Toronto to New York City and back would be about 10 hours each way. And they've been waiting for us to board for the last two. My anxiety had now transcended beyond anything I felt before, and I couldn't hold together a thought for longer than a single brain synapse. My breath was shallow, my eyes darted and everywhere and then back into my phone. Where are you? Three minutes. My phone buzzes. A picture I'd taken months before in Portugal pops up. Dave standing, his back turned to me, slipping out into the Atlantic Ocean. Where are you? I half yell into the phone. I'm, I'm right outside the station. His voice is indignant. Where are you? The bus is on Clinton, right? What? Fuck! No! Where are you? My voice is shaking and I've officially lost control. I'm on Clinton. Where are you? Have you walked away from Main Street? Yes. Go towards it. And I take off. My back to the setting sun that has just begun to peek around the old red brick. I have to trust that he got off at the right subway stop. I have to trust that he's close. I have to trust that I'm heading in the right direction. I have to trust that we'll find each other. And each stride pulls me further apart, 
I'm stretched out. My body is ready to snap back to all of the responsibilities the bus represents at the second I can no longer take it. I had chosen to guess that he was east of me because the through street was more obvious. And if you're going to make it, he couldn't be far. Two minutes. As I run, I shout into the phone, Do you see someone running like a fucking maniac? <laughs> what? Do you see me? I stop abruptly at the corner of the next street and glance up to the sign and discover that I guessed right. And yet he was still nowhere to be seen. Where are you? A woman sitting on a pink folding chair at the side of a convenience store glances up at me and gestures across the street. I follow her arm and see him, his bag slung over his shoulder, walking south towards me and the intersection. Dave? I pant into my phone. My voice trembles with a cocktail of panic and only vaguely controlled adrenaline coursing through my veins. I need you to run. Left. Left. My mom taught us this marching song she picked up as a child, and when, and when we went for especially long walks as kids, we'd sing it. Dave and I traveled everywhere together, to school in the morning, whichever one, at home, at whichever one it was that day, every night. In grade six, my class went on a trip for, for three days up north, which at the time, by my recollection, was the longest consecutive streak of separation we would have experienced since he came into this world. My body revolted. The first night after being kept up in part due to homesickness, I vomited from the top bunk and all, and all over my friend's bags. A life on the road can only be seen in segments by those of fixed address. And a childhood spent in transit can only be understood in full by those on the train with you. One minute. I hang up. I slip the phone into my pocket and take off back in the direction of the buses, refusing to look back and see if he was followed. Foot underneath foot, my tired legs pounding into the solid sidewalk cement. The sun still peeks around the red brick, now half blinding me as I try to dodge the confused pedestrians. Everything I brought with me was back on the bus, so there was nothing to weigh me down. But halfway back up the block, out of the corner of my eye, I catch movement from the other side of the street. Someone is matching my pace. Another few strides, and Dave's distinctive curly hair comes into view, his olive green backpack sagging and pulled backwards by the wind. I steal a glance across the street and see him sprinting, running with the vigor to match every ounce of anxiety that my now expanded lungs were forcing out of my chest. Stride for stride, he matched me. Two neurons in the same synapse. Left, left, left my wife and 45 kids in a starving condition with nothing but gingerbread things I did. Right, right, right from the country, hate from Stratford, shit, my gym, go left. <laughs> I ran the corner as he darts through traffic to, uh, to get onto our street. In front of us, only one bus remains. I beat Dave to the door, but stand to the side so he can board first. As he does, I turn to follow him, nodding to the bus driver, stealing a glance to the woman who's kept my bus distracted, trying to convey my thanks without words, and slump into my seat. Dave's adjusting his bag beside me. The bus pulls away in New York traffic. We don't speak of what just happened of what just almost happened. We don't need to. So, the one thing I wasn't mentioned in my introduction that's not on my LinkedIn page, um, is that I'm also a part of a storytelling uh, group in the city and we run an uh, event every month. Uh, I told that in a September, uh, a September one. So, uh, while there was a fantastic uh, introduction, but I'll give you a short introduction of myself as well, because I don't fair. Hello, everybody. Sorry, I swear at you a bunch before saying hi. I <laughs> um, so my name is Stefan uh, Senator. I am both a community animator here. Uh, I also run an storytelling event slash podcast that I run. It's called the Story. Well, a couple of people. 
they might see the webinar, so I should give them credit. Um, uh, Paul Dorn, and Brian Bennis. Uh, it's called The Stories We Don't Tell. And we'll get Bill back to the podcast at the end of this as well. And the last thing, of course, I do is The Green Majority, which is mentioned as well. Um, so those are three things that I mainly do. Uh, this is, the Green Majority is a radio show on CAUT. Uh, the Storytelling Events most certainly a podcast. And then my day job is getting to help all the wonderful people at CSI get to print things. Uh, right before I walked in, someone said that what I should really do, do for you is just tell you the exact IP address of both the printers here, uh, because that would be impressive. Uh, in case you're wondering, it's 192 168 254 251. Um, but thank you. Uh, it's by far the most impressive thing I get. Um, but I want to move on to actually storytelling because that's why you're here. Uh, and the first thing I want to I want to I want to highlight uh, is the difference between storytelling in sort of the in a sense that I sort of take it in the arts world uh, and storytelling and uh, you've probably heard it within, within a um, in a corporate setting or a nonprofit setting. Uh, because there's a distinct difference between those two things, and I want to highlight that because I think it's important. Uh, storytelling from a arts background has really just two things, really. Uh, the only goal of, of storytelling in an arts background is to capture your audience. If you've captured your audience, you've succeeded. There's nothing else you need to do. If you walk off after 10 minutes, you could have done whatever you want, you captured your audience, you told a good story, congratulations. Uh, and the two basic ways to do this uh, is to right, have a compelling narrative, a lot easier said than done, uh, and to convey an emotion, which I'll get back to later as well. Um, and I want to very distinctly uh, match this with corporate storytelling. I'm going to call it corporate storytelling uh, for now. Uh, I don't think it necessarily has to be corporate, but I'm going to call it corporate storytelling because that's easier to have one word for it. Uh, because corporate storytelling is all about trying to sell a thing. Uh, or an idea, or an ethos. Uh, a friend of mine uh, had me put it as um, that the goal is also to get stories, to get you to identify with your brand. Uh, you know, if you've ever seen, ever seen a Nike commercial, the point is that if you were constantly running, you like Nike. Uh, maybe if you kick things occasionally, but mostly it's running for some reason. Um, and so that's sort of the goal of corporate storytelling. And what I want to, what I want to really highlight is that corporate storytelling for nonprofits is a weird thing. Uh, because nonprofits have one thing in my mind that no corporation ever will have necessarily, uh, and you should use it to your advantage, which is that people want to like nonprofits. <laughs> like, they want to identify with your brand. You're, you're doing good things. They want to support you. That's the whole point. If you're a nonprofit who's doing something that people don't want to support, uh, then I don't fully understand how you're a nonprofit. Um, <laughs> And you know, maybe, or at least the people who want to support you won't support you. And, and I think that the, the, the fear I have with a lot of corporate storytelling is that you'll get so caught up in trying to seem like a business or a brand that you'll lose the fact that as a nonprofit, you have that inherent advantage. Right? You have that advantage of people want to like you. Um, and as soon as you stand up and say, uh, you know, like the, the glossiest, glossiest web video. Uh, that makes you look like Nike makes you Nike in their minds. It doesn't make you a super successful nonprofit necessarily. Um, and so the difference here, the difference I want to, I want to, and there's a way you can use that to your advantage. Is the is the point I'm going to get at, uh, which is that corporate storytelling, especially for nonprofits, should never should never forget the the real goal, the goal of original storytelling, which is grab your audience, convey an emotion, uh, and specifically. I think that corporate storytelling really actually does the opposite of what you want to do. Corporate storytelling wants to put an emotion in somebody else and have them feel it towards you. I think as a nonprofit organization and, and, and compelling storytelling is you take the emotion and put it out there. And if they, if they, and if they absorb it, great. If they don't, you will probably never get them anyways. Uh, and the people who absorb your emotion will be with you. We, we talk a ton in our, in, our, in our storytelling, when we do the workshops for a storytelling thing, about trusting your audience. Uh, which basically means if you tell a compelling narrative, uh, your audience will be there with you. And if they're not going to be there with you after you tell a compelling narrative, they were never going to be with you in the first place. So just forget those people and focus on the people who get it. Um, and so what we want to get to here is the idea that that if there's, if you're, even as you are writing your own stuff, um, the start with your own feeling, uh, or your organization's feeling. 
you know, find whatever feeling you think uh, drives your work. Uh, you know, everyone has a different nonprofit, profit thousands of things, whether it's spreading knowledge uh, or making sure people have access to water. Everyone has a different sort of goal in mind. And so everyone comes with a different feeling, or you come at it for a different reason. Maybe you got fed up with the corporate sector and now you're here. That's compelling. Um, and the more you use your own people in your in your work to actually be the people, they, like I'm trying to find out how to explain this. Um, the more you find a way to have your own employees, or if you are an employee, you uh, be a full person to the audience or to your to your people. That's what they really want to do. I ran a fun little example, example of this about a year and a half ago. I was given control of CSI's Facebook. Uh, which is a thing that CSI does, which is brilliant storytelling, by the way. Uh, which is every week we give our we give our Facebook page to a different person uh, who's another member of CSI. So I got it about a year and a half ago, uh, and what I wanted to set out to do uh, was I just wanted to find out what other people did, but not what they're not why they're at CSI, but the other thing that they did. You know, it's like oh yeah, you come in, you work for this final project. What else are you interested in? What's the other? What's your side project basically? Um, and what came of that was a fascinating, b some of the most successful, uh, like not to do my horn, but I, <laughs> at the time I had the most successful post of all time on CMS Facebook page, which was about another staff member who had started something called Bike Batman. Uh, bike Batman, uh, Kyle Chance. Uh, he did a thing with the Bike Batman where he really biked around the city, pumped up people's tires, uh, because he thought that people would be more likely to like biking if they weren't always riding on unpumped up tires. <laughs> uh, this thing absolutely blew up. Uh, it was before CSI, before Facebook started sort of throttling our numbers a little bit, so like I had an unfair advantage for more recent incandescence. Uh, but still, uh, it's an example of sort of here was Kyle just telling a random thing he did, uh, and it became uh, probably perhaps the best marketing that we had for that entire month. Uh, and it has nothing to do with CSI really. It's just hey, here's a guy who works at CSI, he does something cool. Uh, but it personalized him, right? He wanted to support Kyle. Kyle's a cool guy. He pumps your butt, he, he probably pumps your tires sometimes. <laughs> um, so with that thought, we're specifically coming back to the thought of uh, how important it is to convey some sort of passion or emotion in your in your story. Uh, I have a short, it's going to take me not, it'll take nine minutes if you do it effectively. Uh, pair off uh, with whoever's beside you. I think we have two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven. So one, one person, uh, either do three eggshells on the back. That's perfect. We have actually exactly numbers for two and two. Fantastic. Um, so what we're going to do is spend three minutes not talking to anybody, uh, thinking of one thing you're passionate about. I don't care if it's, I don't care what it has to do with. Does it have to do with your business? Does it have to do with your nonprofit? Does it have to do with anything you do? There's something that gets you worked up in any way. Uh, it can be how annoying it is to bike in the snow, because it's annoying and it sucks. Uh, that's fine. I just think of some one thing you do one that like you have passion about. And then, with your partner after that three minutes, spend three minutes explaining it to your partner, and then your partner spend three minutes explaining it to you. It should take a grand total of nine minutes. I've added one extra minute to this thing, because I understand it takes time to plan those sort of things. Uh, so in 10 minutes, we'll regroup. Thanks. Do you have Maybe pick your partner first, and then, then start silence. Like, what's
Yeah, and people actually they walk into a class. They almost like almost as a pattern of plugins on the phone. They almost see the pattern of what kind of music they just want it. They just want four of their words. And they want they want to hear something they're familiar with so they can sing along. <laughs> Or maybe the game is still going. Game is still going. Uh, 
if I can steal all your attention back to the front, I promise we'll talk at the end again. I think. He'll just walk away right away, that's also an option. Uh, but networking also do exist at the end. Um, so, so I hope that was, uh, you. Uh, when, when I get there, uh, it sort of leads me to my next point. I hope you all uh, found some feeling uh, in, that, in that last 10 minutes, uh, which is a saying I stole uh, from a fellow storyteller, Brian Bennis. Because uh, again, she might watch the webcast eventually, so she might soon. Um, <laughs> Uh, she's also one of the one of the people also on my podcast on the podcast that we run. Uh, so uh, you will, you can hear much more from her if you like. Uh, but where that really comes from uh, is what it means is that when you're telling a story or writing a story, because uh, when I usually do, I at least I personally am the kind of person who needs to write a story out first before I get up. Uh, there are some people who sort of feel like they can just get up and tell a story, uh, and there are some people who are fantastic at that. You know, you, you all know the you know, the uncle or the or the aunt or the sister who can just tell an amazing story about what just happened off the top. Uh, but for storytelling like this, I find it's uh, I personally like writing. So we're, for the, for the sake of this, we're saying we write. Um, and so when you find yourself writing a piece, um, if you write a piece something that matters to you, people will people will feel it. Uh, and the and the biggest the biggest uh, thing, the biggest thing I can warn you from doing is write something that you think other people will feel because uh, if you don't feel it, no one is. Uh, if your story doesn't land for you, it's going to land for no one uh, because it's just not because everyone else is going to feel you not feeling it, and then you're going to try to give this thing, and I'm going to be like, uh, <coughs> if you, like you know, it's just like telling someone the story about your dream. Uh, you they know you're fine. It was a dream. Here you are now. Carry on. <laughs> Uh, and so, telling a story without your own personal feeling uh, is um, is doing that, but uh, but not in dream form. <laughs> um, and so, so basically, what that means is start with your feeling first. Uh, and I know the word saying that sort of like, like well, what does that mean? And what it comes down to really is this idea that the feelings, like when you're writing something, you're gonna get to a part where you find it very hard to write. You get you get into a part where um, you really, you know, you skip over it, you want to get past it, you want to move on to the next thing. So the next, next thing's fun. This is sad, that thing is funny though, so let's get there. Um, and, you'll, and you'll skip over all these parts because they'll be harder for you to write. Write those parts. Uh, go, go back and only write those parts. Uh, because those are the parts that actually matter to you. Those are the parts you're trying to get around. And you don't have to actually, you can write them just for yourself. You don't have to actually tell anybody those parts. Uh, but in writing them, you'll find out how you'll get closer and closer to actually what really matters to you, what, what, what the feeling behind the story is. Uh, you'll, you, you, the worst thing you can do in a story is tell a story that everyone knows you're actually sad about as if it was a joke. Because everyone will hear the story, know you're actually sad about it, but you're making all these jokes and silly being confused, and then they'll, and then they'll check out. Um, if a story is actually very funny to you and it's very funny, then that's, that's wonderful as well. But... Finding your feeling first gives you the power to actually sort of confidently get up there and be honest with the audience. And your honesty will be accepted and understood by any audience with that. Um, and so, there's a, there's a, what's funny about this is that, yeah, that goes back to sort of what I talked about when we're talking about storytelling in a more traditional uh, art sense. And so obviously there's a, there's a, there's a, a lot of people who are writing for, for nonprofits are gonna have a, a reaction time. It's like, well, I can't be brutally honest. Uh, I, in my, like, I work for a nonprofit. I can't say all the things I'm thinking. Because half the things I'm thinking will get people mad at me. Uh, and I need to keep my job. Uh, my job's important to me for some reason. Um, and, and so at that point, I would challenge you that, you, yes, maybe, but write it all out first, and then that's going to cut in things. Uh, you know, you don't have to, you, when you're writing, writing this stuff, no one else is going to see it. And then you can edit out the parts where you're like, oh yeah, I really should not say this. Ooh, should not have said that. Uh, and then you get to a point that's both honest to yourself and won't get too far. Um, or, you know, or whatever the consequence you're concerned about uh, in running it. Uh, but if you don't get to the honesty first, you're never going to tell an authentic story. Uh, and then you're going to have a much, much harder time uh, winning over your audience or getting anyone to really pay attention to what you have to say. And so, how you convert that... Uh, to sort of corporate storytelling, uh, as we come back to that sort, of, that sort of phrase, is that if you 
you're doing this in a in a sense uh, where you go up and you and you and you and you and you you know you try to be like, hey, look what you should do. You should you, know, you, you should really care about my nonprofit because it does lots of good things. Here's a list of things that nonprofit does, and and you should like these things. <coughs> Uh, or honestly, I, I, I find a lot of the storytelling that is that sort of is about another person. Honestly, not the most effective. Um, you can you pull it off, but lots of people are like, well, you try to tell the stories because you're helping, uh, which again is valuable. But if that's all you're doing, they're still identifying with you. Uh, and so if you're telling a story about how you're helping this demographic, demographic people, everyone might be really really touched to help that demographic people. But maybe there's another nonprofit that's doing that better. Uh, or maybe they send up someone else and then, you know, that they that they they find another way of doing it. Or maybe they'll tell themselves like, well, actually, someone else someone else's responsibility. Uh, but if you want people to actually sort of identify with what you're doing, you have to tell your story, um, or your you know, your organization story, or anything like that. What what you have to tell a story that drives you or your organization to doing this. Because uh, anything but that uh, is uh, is acting like a, a corporation. It's acting like Nike. It's acting like. Uh, Adidas or I'm just choosing shoe companies for some reason, uh, but it works for everyone. It's like, it's like Bell or Rogers. You know, have you ever seen those Rogers or Bell ads where the entire family is super happy in that like in their house, uh, and there's like, they're all on their iPads, and you sort of watch this weird dystopian future where everyone is smiling yet no one is looking at each other. Um, that's them trying to make you feel like iPads will make your family happy, uh, but nobody buys it. Nobody sees like nobody sees that ad and is like, man, fifteen more iPads would really solve my problem. Because uh, they're not telling us like, and, and that's a problem with, with, with being big organizations. So they have no ability to actually be honest with you because uh, they're yeah, they're doing other things. Uh, yeah, webcast. Don't want to see. And so uh, and so obviously so I what I want to get to so there's. A, what I've done now is like what, I, what I had to, what I was starting with when I started thinking about doing this uh, this talk was it was a funny thing where I didn't know where I could start or where I could end uh, because you could talk about this forever. Arguably, I could talk for about half an hour every week on the podcast that I run, which I do. Um, and so I want to leave you with uh, some resources to actually keep learning more. Uh, three fun little tips that you can find um, on. The, 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 you find the podcast, which I will pitch at the end, uh, and then also uh, and a couple other places you can get. If you're interested in storytelling and want to move further on for this, uh, there's a whole wide range of options, and I want to sort of like give you some weight wasting before because honestly, I could talk for another 20 minutes uh, or hour or two hours, and it wouldn't get close to where uh, the information that exists out there is. Uh, so, on the podcast, we talk about there's three things to come back to pretty early on. Uh, the first uh, is uh, finding a frame for your stories. Uh, you'll notice in the piece that I told at the beginning, uh, the frame of the story was, I was about to miss a bus. That was the frame of the story. Uh, but no one would think the emotion of the story came from that. The, the frame, the, 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 the bus, meeting at the bus was a way to tell the story of myself and my brother growing up. Uh, or the emotion of my, of the, between my brother and I uh, and the sort of interaction we had together. I can't just stand up here and tell you for 10 minutes that my brother and I have a complicated but loving relationship, because uh, that's really boring. Uh, now, if I'm a bus in five minutes, that's fascinating, and I can also have the same that if I have impact. Uh, and so you'll find often that once you find your feeling, you'll be like, okay, I really want to talk about this, but how about I do it? How you do it is you find a frame for it. You find something that happened in your life or in your work that you can connect those two pieces uh, and then work your way through it. Uh, second one uh, is I just called cut cut cut, uh, which has to do with the famous line that no one ever said that that speech went too short. Um, no one's ever going to be super unhappy that you have that you tried to tell totally a short story instead of a longer one. Uh, if you leave people wanting more, that's fantastic. Uh, but if you tell a full complete story in the shortest amount of time, that's also great. Uh, and you want people. In, what's interesting is when you're working through the right process. You'll have a line or two you really, really like at the beginning, and by the end of it, that will not make any sense to your story. And then you really won't want to cut it, because that's the whole point of the story, right? That's the whole point. Uh, it's not. Uh, and usually this is when someone else reading it is helpful. Someone else reading it will probably be like, actually, you don't need this whole chunk. You're like, oh, really? Yeah, great, done. Um, and people really can't listen to stories you know, longer than seven to ten minutes. Uh, if, they're, if you're in front of them, if, they're on, you know, if it's a video, you probably have three. Um, and so it's all depends on how you're actually communicating it. Uh, 
And the third one uh, is, again, just one random example uh, of all the different ways tricks you can do, but it's called hiding your ending. Uh, because a lot of the stories, or I call it hiding your ending, uh, a lot of the stories that you want to tell don't end. Uh, because life is still going, you are still here. Uh, mine happened to have a very sort of useful ending, which was the, the bus drives away. Great ending to a story. Um, but I, told, I tell another story, which the ending of the story happens in the middle of the trip to New York. Uh, and, and you get stuck in this position where you're wondering, like, well, how on earth do I end this story? Uh, but it definitely needs to end where it needs to end. Uh, and the way, uh, the way you have to do that is that it's a very, very simple and easy little trick, which is that you probably get about a paragraph at the beginning to hint at something, and if you read back at the end, everyone accepts it over the story. <laughs> it just works. If you have a line at the beginning of the story, and you say it at the end, everyone's like, great, story done. <laughs> and it feels right. You don't have that sort of negative reaction. You lead up to it, you just land on it. You can almost end wherever you like. As, but as long as you hide the story, uh, hide the ending of the story at the beginning of the story, and you come back to it, everyone's brain is like, oh, there's a callback, that must be the end of it. Um, big warning, uh, don't keep talking after that. <laughs> uh, because that, uh, because the terrifying part with that is you start becoming the Lord of the Rings. Uh, we call it the Lord of the Rings effect uh, in, in, locally because as soon as you have an ending that people think the story's going to end, and then you keep talking, then the next ending they're worried it will keep going, and then suddenly they're concerned they'll be sitting in front of you forever. <laughs> and it may never end. Um, and so if you have an obvious ending, end it then. And if you think of an obvious ending but you want to keep going, get rid of that first obvious ending, because it will make people terrified, you will never let them leave it. Um, and there's, so we go, again, I mentioned this other things, we go over a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so what I will do somewhere um, is, actually, I'll write on this, where I'm here. Um, uh, if you're interested in the podcast, the podcast is just at uh, thereapers.org. Uh, we call it that because we're in the life collecting business. Um, it's a dark joke, but you find it funny. Um, it's thereapers.org slash podcast. Um, there's also, uh, I wrote, uh, if you're interested in the sort of corporate storytelling or the, non, the non-profit structure, uh, or how I think non-profits can use communication better, uh, about two years ago, I wrote 5,000 words on, on this for, for some reason. Uh, and I put it back up on a Medium page in case anyone wanted to read it, because I used I stole some of it for this piece. So I figured, why not? So I got it there. Um, and then the last thing is, if you want a one-on-one coach, or someone to talk to you sort of more directly, uh, another CSI member uh, named Kate Hodgson runs something called 9 to 5 Narrative and also runs a storytelling uh, business where she helps coach individual people if that's okay. Um, so, and with that, I will write those things on here and I will answer any questions that exist here or apparently online if anyone is watching, unless they're all insulting me because the internet is mean, but <laughs> in which case, I like you better. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I can I can listen to a question while I write this. So if anyone has a question, are you writing those three points again? Uh, I certainly can. Um, you in black so we can see. Uh, here's, do I have black? I have a graph line. <laughs> uh, it's my job to keep these meeting rooms uh, well stocked. Uh, <laughs> so carry on. That was blue work. Um, so while we are writing up the points, I also want to take an opportunity to say that we are also taking notes for these uh, for the, all of these events. Uh, so all the points that Stephen mentioned, we're going to put that in the blog post. Uh, once that's ready, we're going to send it back out to the Meetup community. Um, if you're not part of the community, uh, please do, because we can only contact you guys through Meetup, <laughs> because that's the, the medium that we have. Um, again, if you have quite questions for Stefan, please uh, feel free to ask out loud. We want to keep this like a very casual, informal environment. Uh, but I do want to plug the next event. So Toronto Net Tuesday, or more, more recently we've been calling it uh, Net Square Toronto. We have events every month. So next month is actually on March. Um, I don't remember the exact date. Um, it's on our it's on our meetup page, and the event will be actually organized by one of our co-organizers, Farah, who's at the back. <laughs> and the event will be on coding or basics to coding. So if that's what something that. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you have. Um, like, honestly, and you think you don't need it until you. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. so that if that's something that's of interest to you or of, of interest to other people that you know, please let them know. It's, again, it's a free event um, and we'll be in this beautiful space. But going back to Stephen, do you guys have any questions for storytelling? 
I also, you also just, if you email me at my name, which is a step in socialinformation.ca, I can send you to my notes, which oh. might be faster. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <I'm actually laughs> Joyce can also do that. <laughs> uh, yes, anyways, uh, before I over to you, have a Any questions? Yes. Do you um, have any tips for trying to get a feel for your audience? I mean, imagine someone who's just kind of intuitive, and let's say you know you're going to talk to a certain group, and you have a sense, possibly, yeah. so I'm going to speak from my own experience. I think we had a really interesting exchange earlier in the exercise because I just couldn't express myself. And partly it's because the things I'm passionate about, I, even though my colleague is, is stellar, I have a block because I think it's a little annoying. Mm. Um, and it's also very personal for me. Mm. But the point being, what I'm trying to get at is, you're trying to, um, you can't manipulate it. Mm. You can't predict how your stories are going to end. Mm. But you are somehow going to read the people. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your experience in that or any thoughts that might come in that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, what, so one thing I did do uh, for the when, when I was doing stuff in the Green Society campaign was go talk to high schools. Uh, if you ever want to talk to the least cooperative audience in the world uh, that is on the internet, uh, choose grade 10 high school students. Um, uh, and, you, and, you really, and you really just become, you have, uh, honestly, uh, the best advice I can give uh, is, so I'm, I'm, I know it's more already, uh, so one of the other things we say uh, is fuck the audience. Um, because at some point, uh, if you are if you are being uh, if you're gonna you're gonna give them what you give them, and if they don't get it, that's on them. Uh, and so uh, I, it's it's interesting feeling talking to an audience that doesn't is not paying attention. Uh, it's one of the most difficult feelings that really does exist. Um, and you sort of have to. What I try to do is I sort of I I always know one person asked me to be there, so they have to pay attention to me. <laughs> Um, and so I, I, like, I, would, I would end up honestly half talking to the teacher uh, in these classes uh, because they had to pay attention. <laughs> uh, and so, if, and, 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 and so I, if you can find that one compelling, uh, that one compelling, uh, compelling person who's actively listening, um, and there always will be at least one, uh, you can just tell a story to them. And, and, and that what I can do is people have different react, people have different facial expressions when they're paying attention or not paying attention. Uh, I know that because I'm a doomer. Uh, uh, if I'm in a meeting and I am probably wrong on every piece of paper I have with me, uh, but it's a way to keep my mind active while I'm listening. If I'm not doodling, I'm probably not paying attention. Uh, but I know it's not very helpful with somebody who's talking uh, because uh, because then you know, it looks like I'm not paying attention. It's hard to get that feedback which you need as, a, as an audience. Um, but people may be. Uh, and what I found fascinating was often I would give these talks to these students and they would be seemingly completely oblivious. And then occasionally one would put their hand up and ask me a question, which meant they actually had been listening this entire time. And I was like, wait, what? what? <laughs> and then I would hear you know, them carry on. Uh, and so I think the best advice I can give you uh, is find the one person in the audience who you sort of, uh, who you know you can trust can be there. And even if it's a colleague, even if you know it's the other person in the space you brought with you, uh, who has helped you carry the stuff into the venue. Um, they, uh, and, 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 then, and then tell it to that person, tell it to the person who's listening. Uh, because You'd be surprised how many other people also are. Uh, yeah? Um, so one thing I would say is that it helps to actually know your audience by arranging talks from my IPAR students. And I always have to tell the speakers, you are speaking to the converted. Mm. So don't just tell us how great all this stuff is. Tell us really nitty gritty success stories, what you've done, uh, what works, what doesn't. So I'm always giving my speakers to really tailor it to people who already are involved. Because mm. a, a lot of times people will talk as if people don't know the topic. Right. So yeah. I just want to point that out. Yeah, yeah. Any information you can get from, you can get about your audience beforehand, obviously very valuable. Um, I think especially from a content perspective, so if you're telling a story that you, 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 get, you get deeper in, like, if I, if I started coming to a place where uh, you were all in a storytelling workshop, and this was the 15th thing, I would have probably not said anything I said at the beginning, just said the last three minutes. Uh, and I said that the whole show, or the whole talk. Uh, because, yeah, you have to sort of, when you content specifically, yeah, you have to know the audience. Yes? Can you speak about, um, sort of like, when you work for an organization, and um, 
essentially that organization has its own history, has its own story, has its own reason for being. And mm -hmm. essentially you come into that organization and you're like, wow, I'm in this organization, awesome. Now you have to try and tell the story mm -hmm. of your organization without having any of that. Mm -hmm. that yeah. Well, I, the passion's there, but it's like, do you start from where you're at and tell the story from that point? Right. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so I do a bit of both. Uh, one thing I do uh, for CSI is I give tours here all the time. Uh, I, I give tours about once every, well, maybe once every two days, and sometimes multiple in the same day. Um, and CSI's been around for 12 years. Uh, 12 years ago, uh, I was in grade 10, um, and I wasn't really doing a lot of things uh, related to CSI. Um, and so the, what I've done is I, I think you can mix it is what I think. Because there's, so there's a part of it, so like part of it is it's part of CSI story that I, that I love. Uh, and, and, and I, I think that the, telling that part of the story, I think I can still convey the emotions I like. Uh, but then there's another part of the CSI story which, uh, which, is per, which is personal to me. And so that, so for example, part of the CSI story that I love is the idea that five people, five nonprofits came together uh, and just said what would happen if we shared. Now, what, that's, to me, that is such a fascinating thought process when, not, when it wasn't happening. And they just came together like, you know what? We're just going to try this thing, We're gonna, and it's going to work. Uh, and we're going to make it work because it makes sense to us. And, and then all the weird, and then I don't know all the little nitty gritty fights that they had beforehand or after or how it worked. I don't know anything about that. But I just love that one little piece. And so that's the piece I tell. Uh, and the part that's more personal to me is uh, I'm a generally cynical human being. Um, and CSI is very, is radically optimistic. That's what I'm um, and, and so, and so being around a random this don't say being, you hear these things like, oh, we're, you know, we're, we're going to change the world. Changing the world is thrown out here like it's candy. Uh, the idea that every single person that's changing the world is literally fan candy in the audience. Um, but what got me, uh, was when I realized that, uh, we actually had just we had done a sustainability audit uh, on the toilet paper at Annex, uh, or that we actually bought organic uh, milk and coffee, uh, or that our coffee, our, our coffee was fair trade and our milk was organic. Um, and I was like, oh wait, you guys are actually, you aren't just, you aren't, you aren't Nike, right? You're not actually just saying, yeah, what well, great things are doing, and they're not actually doing it. They owned the nitty gritty, they were actually doing it. Uh, and that's the part of the story that's mine. Because, that's uh, you know, Tony Sermon is not going to up here and be like, you know what I did? I bought organic coffee. Because uh, uh, that's not that's not the part of the story that matters. Term, it's what it's what got me first. Uh, and so I think you can sort of do both. I think you can find the parts of your story that you love, and then and then expand on the parts uh, that were more on that said more about you when you started or what got you in space, something like that. Yes. Just like a mechanics question. Like, yeah. I was surprised that you read your story. Mm -hmm. So if you have a seven ten minute window, yeah. I mean, you don't want to memorize, but you want to learn and and kind of deliver. Maybe with the odd notes mm -hmm. as sections, mm -hmm. you want it to be kind of spontaneous, but you want to stay on, on track. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's fascinating. So, yeah. So the story that I, I read it in part, uh, I think my first of the story, I, I had it almost memorized. Um, and what's interesting also is that occasionally you can feel the crowd. Is it like talking about feeling the crowd? Occasionally you can tell the crowd will let you get away with a joke, uh, and so you can throw an extra joke in there somewhere. Um, and I did that actually the first time I told the story. Um, but I think that so, what what why I why I did read it is that you're telling a more complicated story, um, and why we sort of are event more, more ensure, allows people to have notes, which most storytelling events in the city don't. The reason why we let them do people do that is because if you're telling a difficult story or a complicated story, uh, and you and you lose your place or you start to get lost, a little bit lost, uh, the default is to start telling jokes. The default is to take a step back, pull yourself out of the whole scenario, and then start being self-referential. Being like, look at that guy doing that thing, right? Um, which sort of ruins the whole story, uh, depending on the type of story. See, but like, if this story halfway through, I had sort of gotten lost a little bit, and it started just telling riffing jokes about how weird the bus driver was, um, it would have ruined the whole thing. Um, and so, what I would say the, the best scenario, honestly, would be to have, uh, be, to be like, especially if you're giving a seven-time story, would be have have prepared, write the whole thing out first, get as close as you can to memorize it, um, but also be be willing to sort of you, you play with them a little bit. Um, but that's the reason why we the why I have why we have notes. And then the other part about it is if you're telling a story that is not a conventional story. Uh, so most storytelling is meant to the story is very one direction, right? It's I went out, I did this thing, this thing went this, 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 that. 
Um, and that's really easy to tell in a direct, in a direct way. Uh, because you just remember what happened. Uh, but like, if I say had forgotten to repeat uh, the weird jingle my mom taught us uh, in the middle time, it loses its impact. Uh, and, you, and you lose those bits of the story that actually can, that can be required for people to really feel. Um, See, without eye contact, it's hard to reach somebody's heart. Yeah, yeah, so it's exactly, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a balancing act. Um, the, like, you know, if, if there's a, if there's a story, yeah, like, so I think the, the goal is probably, if you can be, like, the goal is to get it memorized well enough that you actually feel pretty confident standing up there, but the thing about having the notes with you is that it lets you present it in a way that you're not, uh, you're not doing this, right, like, you don't have to remember it, if you forget, you can just look in and read it, um, and if, and, and that's the, and there's a bit of a, there's a, that allows you to be more present in the room. Uh, it's, it's you know it's depending if you're super good at memorizing and you can and I've seen some performers who can just do it right. There's some performers who've gotten so good at memorizing they can just give you a 10 minute story they perfect memorized and it will feel like they it will feel like every single bit of things like that that they just told you. And if you do that, fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, but most people can't do that, uh, especially since we're busy people doing other things. Uh, and so it's a it's always a balance. Anybody? Yes. So as a writer, I always kind of struggle with the concept of it's not just about what you say, but how you say it. Mm. Um, so I wanted to, to kind of ask you uh, personally, uh, how conscious are you of your rhetoric? Uh, or how you're right. are you So do you kind of consciously manipulate certain sentences, or is it, do you kind of let it flow naturally? Uh, it's like hot to say a little bit of both, but you know, um, a little bit of both. <laughs> uh, so the so for something like, for example, let me give an example. Uh, so for the left, left, the that whole bit, uh, which apparently I had remembered entirely wrong. My mom had to send me an email correcting me what it wasn't about. <laughs> um, uh, but um, so that so something like that, that was very intentional, right? Uh, it was a, it was a rhetorical device I was using throughout the entire piece to tie together the difference, mm -hmm. um, and also and also a rhetorical device to to mark changes in time. You know, it allowed me to jump forward in little bits pieces that and explain things. Uh, so okay, that's what I'm used to it. Um, but more, but the other thing, the flip side of that is, more often than not, I'll get to a point where I just really need to place set. Uh, so an example of that would is, um, I can say I'm standing in front of a room, and you all can picture me standing in front of a room. Uh, or I can say I'm standing uh, in the on the fourth floor of C uh, the Center of Social Science, and the lights are banked in the middle that go down to. To the, which lift up the light to the middle and darken the outsides. Uh, and the, the yellow brick, uh, I can see the yellow brick behind everyone, and you know that's something else. Um, and the, you can take one or two sort of, you take a bit of uh, a bit of luxury to sort of explain a little bit like that. And in part, is in part the value of that is it lets people sort of sit in the space for half a second. Uh, because if you keep running through everything in, in point by point by point. point uh, no one's ever sort of sat past them, uh, and they, don't, they may not be in that room when they need them to be. Uh, so, the, so the part I'm going to give you an example. So the part in my story where I mentioned the red brick, uh, the, the sun to on the red brick, uh, that I sort of added in afterwards because I was like, I have, the story is moving too fast. Uh, I'm, it's, it feels like it's too much. It's going too quickly through all the things, and I need a way to slow things down. And in describe, and that, and this was intentionally sort of a little way like I get away with some fiery language. I, you know, I, I take some, I, 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 I play around with some sort of rhetoric and that, and that slow pieces. But the point of it is really actually just to slow the story down. Um, and so, I would say uh, let it flow, but then come back to it. Um, cause, and then, because like sometimes, sometimes you have to cut it, sometimes you have to add to it. And there's no, there's no knowing what you're going to need to do until you finish the story. Uh, we usually, the, the first advice we gave is write it all out first and then come back to it. Uh, because they spend too much time freaking out about the first three lines of the second story, you never write a story. Um, and usually you'll cut those first few lines anyways. So. <laughs> uh, yes? Uh, are we thinking that the, for a non-popular story telling, story telling um, you're presenting something that sounds like you're like representing an organization. Hmm. There's always a gap between the story you're talking about. Like, either the story belongs to the organization and they're not fully engaged, or it's your story and it's not like an organization. So, Right. How would you feel this gap? Uh, I guess I guess I would I would impart. Uh, I think for mo for many people at least, 
there's a part of you that will be the organization anyways. Uh, and so uh, I would agree that if you tell the organization story, it's not going to be you. Uh, but I think you can tell your story and still be part of the organization. Um, and, and for example, you know, for example, um, the way uh, you know when I'm so, so like CSI is not my story. Uh, I don't have any control. Like CSI is a whole bunch of other people's stories, uh, and I'm a just a blip of this whole thing. Um, but yeah, I still feel like I can tell a story uh, that encapsulates sort of what people love about CSI. Um, and it's still, it'd be both, and share it with, with your organization. Uh, and yes, you're right, it won't be, I may, maybe I'm giving one piece of the organization, uh, a picture of the organization, I'm not giving the full picture of the organization, but if I got, say, but if I got uh, one person from every, every, every one of every staff, and one every member, I can, you can slowly build out a real picture of the organization. Um, so, and you sort of have to accept that no one story is going to, uh, is going to do everything. Uh, the most fascinating thing that we come to uh, we come across in our storytelling event uh, is that one, when someone comes into us, comes to us, uh, they always have one story they want to tell. They're like, "I got to tell this story," uh, and then they, and then they, and they, and they read it to us, and you read it, and you're like, "You actually have like four stories in that story," uh, because it's usually they have this. I, I started calling it the origin story because they have this one story that's like that's created all their other stories, and so they want to get all of these things into the story, and you have to be accepting you're never going to do that. You're never going to tell a story that's everything. That's everything. You're, you can tell a story about one moment in time and one part of your organization, but just, I think trying to sum up your organization's ethos as a as a uh, in one story, uh, unless you're very very young, is going to be a failing venture anyways. So why not just tell a compelling story about one little part? Because uh, and then and then if you and then you feel like oh, but I didn't mention this, tell another story. That is always more stories to be told. Yes, Jay. When you're trying to send them a ton of mm. support, um, back to a one shot telling story. Unfortunately, you can't tell the same story, mm. right? Because I can have a book that I can pitch you where you start getting all these letters and to these typical formats, usually from the beginning of the organization, to tell you when the organization started to build friends with you, to tell you how much great work they're doing. I can't. I don't know any nonprofit that's not doing that kind of good work. Mm -hmm. That's the very definition of nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So there's always a testimonial of sorts. But after you read the 20th potential letter, mm -hmm. you get a little bit of that sort of big cross to pee. Right. So <laughs> what can we do as nonprofits to tell a compelling story that doesn't sound like everything else in the world? Uh, wow. <laughs> Um, <laughs> in two minutes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> cut, cut, cut. Um, uh, I would say tell the hard parts. Uh, you know, tell the parts that suck. Uh, tell the parts that tell the parts you're struggling with that that year. Tell the parts that you know everything is not sunshine and roses, and everyone knows that. Uh, stop pretending that it is. You know, yes, obviously have some sort of uh, you, you you like. There's always value. You 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 can't not give a value proposition. Uh, like, you can't just say, here's a bunch of things that suck this year, now give me $50. Because <laughs> uh, that's not going to work. Um, and so, but I think there's a way, uh, I think the, uh, a way to tell a compelling story, and a way to, the, the way to sort of make it unique, uh, is to tell your own personal hardships. Because you're right, everyone, everyone, is, doing, everyone is doing good work. Uh, but there is, if you, and the part, I think that's the thing, people get too scared about wanting to seem like they're, the most professional, and that we are definitely totally succeeding all the time, huzzah. Uh, and so they skim over everything, and so they write as a surface level piece, right? They write this sort of thing which is like, we did great things, we helped these people, these people are happy now, give us money. Um, and I think, like, think about like, think about the number of stories that exist in the world, number of novels that is in the world. No one thinks that the 17th novel they've read uh, has, you know, is like, well, I've read all the stories now. <laughs> it's done, sweet. I didn't tell told school. It's told school. I already read this one. I'm good. Um, and I think so. I think you have. I think that's the value of bringing your humanity into it. Honestly, I think the value of bringing humanity into it is that it personalizes the narrative. And as soon as you personalize the narrative, you have a character I want to like. And characters are always interesting. Um, and, and you have a whole new. You have a whole. You have such a wider breadth of stories you can tell. 
Like, what if you just told a story about your, I don't know, this one communications intern that you had for six months, right? I bet you that's a compelling story. Uh, I bet you you changed their life in whatever way. Uh, they might not be able to hear anymore, but how much more interesting would that be than just being told that you, you know, did, you know, did generic good? Uh, so I think that I think that personalize it, uh, be more open and honest with people. Uh, be authentic, and that's the, the way to go. So you had an example. Well, I was just going to say another thing is um, is test, test, do your testing. I mean, you can guess, you can guess about what's going to work with your client base, your donor base. But I would not even test it in testing. Um, you know, uh, look at your if you have any sort of like people in Google Analytics, build some of that in um, and test different stories. Because honestly, you can guess. But unless you know you're getting feedback, you can also look and see that quite a bit of um, research has been done on what kind of stories actually really do um, resonate with people. Like for instance, it just really shows um, evidence really shows that speaking about one person or one animal or one situation is much more effective in regards to fundraising than speaking on a large like you do about a whole bunch of people or even like three animals um, telling one single person story. And I think as you say, like with an authentic voice, not only worrying, it should necessarily be your story, like, you know, your question, I just think that, you know, find someone else, to provide a vehicle for someone else's story, um, provide, a, a, give someone else a voice who you're helping or who your organization is helping, and test, test, test. I know it's tricky sometimes because you just don't have the metrics in place, you don't have the donor base in place, but, you know, you can do a full focus group, you can speak to some of your major donors, speak to some of your what's resonating with them, what kind of stories do they want to hear, um, what do their supporters care about, and, you know, pull that research together, too. Just an idea. Thanks. Anybody? Sure. I was actually going to do exactly one thing. Each wildlife center always starts off with some animal that was trapped, mm -hmm. and then we keep the rescue in, and that's generally how we want it. To have something like you just suggested, a story about something that they do. Um, but one of the things that I almost always hang up on people who come in for money, mm -hmm. but the, the mom and the AGO have a wonderful approach for me, which is we just want to let you know what's coming up mm -hmm. so that you might want to commute a membership. Mm -hmm. It's, it works. it's yeah, it works for me generally. I because there's usually something there that I'm interested in. So then it's just a question of okay, what kind of membership is it? <laughs> <laughs> but it's that approach. And if they tested that a thousand million times, mm. so they start figuring out that that's what works. Yeah, well for me well, <laughs> that, and I know we don't really want to call it, but so it's true. For me, that <laughs> approach works because it's it's low pressure, it's not and the doom and gloom stories, like there's so much of that. It's the success story. Are you doing something well? Then maybe I'll support you. If there's all this bad stuff, well. So it, it's, and I guess people work differently. Mm -hmm. It's just that approach kind of works for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you. I imagine we've got way over time yeah. now. No, uh, no, no. Great. Uh, yeah, so uh, again, thank you everyone for uh, uh, coming to this event and also asking questions to Stefan. I'm sure if you have more, he'll be around. Um, I looked up the date. The next event is March 16th. It's on Wednesday um, from 6 to 7. Sorry, 5.30 uh, to 7, 7.30. And it will be downstairs in the whole connector. Um, so and she, uh, she teaches coding and she's a stand-up comedian. Oh, yay! Oh, perfect! Oh, <laughs> the speaker, speaker, not me. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, so again, if you're interested, please look us up on meetup.com slash Toronto-net-tuesday. We're going to work on the URL for that. Um, but yeah, thank you again. If there's food on the back, please help yourself. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, so, so what we do is, uh, so we're going to do cards for a bunch. Uh, we 